any road you take is like the road you know you're going to take. It's just what you know. So how do you find something that you don't know anything about? I don't know. It kind of reminded me of my driving. It's unfamiliar. The first night I was at Iron House. It was a Saturday. It was like just my first time as me driving. And I just felt like going somewhere. So I got in the car and just started to follow the, the green lights. Suppose I viewed it as, uh, as green to go. And that was my path to go. So I went. I like to, to see if I can find my way back. Which like nine times out of ten, I don't. I just end up getting lost. And driving in a bunch of circles. It's kind of what I feel like I'm doing in life. I got lost this way, and I got lost this way, and I seen both ways of the road. See? Great. <laughs> Where'd you get this Creator God, our life, our breath, we thank you for this evening, for this event, and for its reason. Walk with us now, we pray, and hear us. Amen. 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 I want to start this out by saying uh, this doesn't happen without all the support of Guiding Light, board members, sponsors, spiritual directors, donors, therapists. It is a community. And these men here tonight, these five men, have started to show evidence of this new way of living. That they've made a decision and a commitment to do things differently in their lives. And it's represented tonight by staying clean and sober for a year. So we want to acknowledge these men and celebrate this road that they're on. We know it's not that they're not finished yet, but we are a part of the story, and we want the story to continue. Mike Welch is going to be our first one. So Michael, come on up. You feel like you accomplished something by being accepted into the program. It's not just like every other rehab where you just tell them you need help and they accept you and I sit up for, for like a week a lot of people just drop off in the waiting process it's like they're not that serious it's an accomplishment you know you accomplished something you got accepted into a wonderful program you know and I think that's a great way to start off this new leg of your life I don't know I've been using drugs for for a while you know since I was like 12 years old Started smoking pot, drinking, doing what I wanted to, and having fun was far more important than being in school. School like was a nightmare. I just wanted to leave it. I didn't want to be a part of it. I think school initially just started off rough. Like when I think about it now, just, I, I probably always needed glasses. I didn't really, didn't know it. They sat me in the back of the class. It's hard to learn stuff you can't really see. So, I can remember a first grade teacher mistaking me for talking in class. There was a kid next to me, and she kept like pursuing it. Took me out in the hall and kind of wrapped her hands around my neck and lifted me up. I think maybe like that's where school started off really weird. And that was first grade. School sucked after that. When I was like younger, younger, I had pituitary dwarfism. Like your pituitary gland doesn't work when you're a kid, which is what causes you to grow to normal height. So I remember I, my mom telling me like five years old, I was like the size of a three-year-old. So I had to like get these shots of synthetic growth hormone and it caused me to like 
grow during the day and it'd be really painful. Like most kids grow while they're sleeping and that would basically happen to me during the day. So like my legs would hurt really bad or my arms would hurt really bad and that was my body growing in the middle of the day. Like a side effect of it was hypoglycemia. So my mom called them spells, but I'd get really bad headaches and sick. And I remember one time we were in her, her red truck and we were going to my doctor's. I kept coming in and out of consciousness and she had not buckled me in and she had slammed on the brakes. And I remember flying forward and hitting the dashboard. Somewhere I get the feeling that maybe that was the cause of where I accumulated that fear of being in a car, being a kid, always feeling pain. Painkillers became my main focus, you know, to not feel pain. And like where I was from, Clarkston, it was more of like a nicer area. And my parents were like on the lower end yeah, like the lower end of middle class. So it was like, we struggled to, to live in a nice area. So, you know, we didn't have all the, the nice things everybody else had. My parents got divorced when I was like seven or so. Wednesday through Saturday I was at my dad's and then Saturday through Wednesday I was at my mom's. I wasn't really popular at school. I didn't play sports, that kind of set me aside. I wasn't really athletic. The music I listened to and the clothes I wore, like I liked bigger, baggier pants and I liked more or less rock music, you know, Marilyn Manson, Korn, stuff like that. And kind of made me a target to be picked on. You know, like pushing me into lockers or smack my books out of my hands or, you know, lots of name calling. and. The group of friends that I found were a lot like me, and you know, they got picked on too. There was a handful of us. We had this spot in the woods, we called it The Spot, and we'd just play hacky sack and smoke pot all day and drinking. I think really we were all just looking to escape, you know, the, the torment of school, being bullied and picked on. We'd meet up and just leave school and go hang out at the spot. So easy way to find an escape is to use drugs, get high. You don't really feel as much when you're in an altered state. So, so we'd just walk everywhere or skateboard. A lot of us didn't live too far from each other. So we just walked to wherever we'd meet up. I'd meet girls that would have cars and like any of my friends that were looking to hang out, you know, if they had a car, they'd just come pick me up. My dad did give me a car, it's a white Topaz, and it just sat in the driveway forever. What it was is like a, like an extreme fear of that's how I would die it's in a car accident. And I just didn't drive. I would say it was more like a way to avoid responsibility. You know, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with driving, being on the road. It eventually played its role into me manipulating people who had cars into driving me around, picking me up from work. And I just didn't have to do any of that. I don't recall even thinking about, I didn't think about what was after high school. I dropped out in 11th grade. I was like 17 and I just not show up like one day during the week and then turned into two, turned into four, and I just stopped going all together, you know. When ecstasy started coming around and started going to rave parties in Detroit, when I got into like more of my 20s and stuff, then I started to search it out. Harder drugs, 
like ecstasy and I think there's like some meth in there involved. And they got like prescription pills, painkillers, like Vicodin, Narco, Darvis Head, Xanax, and Clonopin, and then speed, such as like Adderall. Those were like more constant. I met a girl, we got together, we had a couple kids, but drugs were my focus, so I wasn't a really loving, caring person. That kind of started eating me up. So the more it was eating me up, the more I'd eat up drugs. Did not feel that. And I moved to my aunt's house for a while, and then I kind of flopped from like my sister's couch to my ex-stepmom's couch flat from apartment to apartment, to somebody's camper, to a cabin in Lake Orion, to a tent in Oxford, to jail. And then from jail I went to a rehab in uh, Canton. Yeah, my first rehab. And that was more or less like looking to avoid homelessness. And it was just what you hear at the the meeting's like a break, you know, from the insanity that was going on. So I was there for a while. And I remember I, towards the end of it, I started working at Target. It was like Christmas time. And I remember walking back one day, and somebody pulled over and asked me if I wanted any, basically, cracker heroin. I was like, no, I'm good. And then I'd seen him somewhere at the gas station, and then I ended up buying some heroin. So I think like I just had a drug test that morning. So I knew I had a week. And eventually like I had to have it. You know, I think it was more addicted to being in an altered mind frame. And then it more or less controlled me rather than me kind of controlling it. It was a whole new level. By this point, I hadn't seen my kids in like five years. Like I knew like it was out of control. So I, I went to Guiding Light and did something different. So when I was in the waiting period at Guiding Light, I had the piece of paper, but I wrote in a journal, like just some goals that I intend, I've been intending on doing for a really long time. So I put all these things on a piece of paper and um, I got my GED and I have my child support situated with the courts. I got my permit and then I got my license. I got a car. I have my own place to live, and I work. Yeah, I've marked them all off, so that's, I think that's awesome, you know? Like, I've really seen that, like, how much connections to other people truly matter to me. Like, it's something that I've always looked for and like all the different ways that I attempted to do it, you know, like at the very beginning of using drugs. Like I, I connected with these people and this is what they did, so this is what I have to do to stay connected with these people. You know, that's, that's not true. I could have been connected with those people had I done those things or not, you know. Truth is, is I'm a person and they're a person and we're ultimately connected just by that alone, you know. I don't have to do what they're doing to be connected with them. Our existence alone is a connection. I think that's awesome. Yeah, the windshield wipers, the blades don't really work too well. Like, I'm sure it's just like a snap-on, snap-off kind of thing, but 
about guiding light, like, like I just, I don't know, I always end up back there when I feel really off. Like I find myself just, like on almost automatic mode, back at guiding light. It's a safe place, and there's lots of guys and lots of true connection. And like when I'm walking up to the building, I, I can feel myself begin to smile. And then when I see the people I, I, I've connected with, like my emotions inside just kind of, I feel a lot better. And we shared a lot, laughed a lot. And we're all going through the same thing. Like when I think of them, you know, I think of like family, brothers. It's like a reset. Or like charging your phone. <laughs> like, like I'm charging my batteries. And I'm good to go for a little while. Mike Welch is gonna be our first one. So Michael, come on up. For the longest time, I've had this idea of who I am, and at the core of that idea was pain and suffering. I had a realization today that that's all that really was, was an idea, just as I had the ability to create that idea. I have the ability to create a new idea of who I am, and this is the beginning of that new idea. Thank you.